Chapter Nine of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Nine: The Letting of Number Six. One. And what am I to do if there's an air raid? Demanded Mrs. Bindle. Bindle deliberately emptied his coffee cup, replaced it in its saucer, sat back further in his chair as a sign of repletion then turned to mrs bindle who had been watching him with angry eyes well there's always god and mr gupperduck mrs b he remarked with the air of a man suggesting an unfailing source of inspiration you always was a scoffer you with your black art mrs bindle's ire was rising and her diction in consequence losing something of its customary precision you know i ain't strong and and ow them guns and bombs frighten me there was in mrs bindle's voice a note of entreaty a daughter of the lord didn't ought to be afraid of a nun besides you can go round and old artie's and he's a rare old hero when there's guns goin off i knew i shouldn't get any sympathy from you complained mrs bindle rising and proceeding to bang away the breakfast things when mrs bindle was suffering from any great stress of emotion she expressed her feelings by the noise she made ironing gave her the greatest opportunities she could bang the iron on the ironing board back again to the stand and finally on to the stove i gotta earn a living remarked bindle philosophically as he proceeded to light his pipe it's war time too and nobody can't afford to move so poor old joe has to take any old job he can get old of you lost your last job a purpose snapped mrs bindle bindle looked at her sharply sometimes mrs bindle's accuracy in things where she could not possibly possess knowledge was startling bindle had temporarily relinquished his situation in the removal department of harridge's stores in order to become caretaker at fulham square mansions whilst his intimate charlie hart had a fortnight's holiday mrs hart had been ill and the doctor said that change of air and scene were essential to her recovery she could not go alone and if mr hart went with her and a substitute were obtained he would in all probability as charlie put it pinch my bloomin job bindle he knew he could trust and so it came about that for a fortnight bindle was to sleep out well you see bindle explained i couldn't disappoint old charlie and what about me demanded mrs bindle looking round from a fierce attack upon the kitchen stove with the poker well said bindle slowly you're a disappointed woman as it is mrs b so you ain't hurt mrs bindle resumed her attack upon the fire with increased vigour you always was a selfish beast bindle she retorted you'll be sorry when i'm dead any reference by mrs bindle to the remorse that he would suffer after her death bindle always regarded as a sort of take cover signal mrs bindle was hysterical and bindle liked to be well out of the way before the storm broke he had heard but had never had an opportunity of testing the statement that without an audience dogs will not fight and women will never have hysterics when therefore mrs bindle referred to what bindle widower would suffer on account of what bindle benedict had neglected to do he rose picking up the faded blue and white cricket cap he invariably wore and walked towards the door there'll be a lot of tips old charlie says he remarked and i'll buy you something i'll run in every day to see you ain't gone off with guppy you're a dirty-minded beast bindle raged mrs bindle but her words beat up against the back door through which bindle had vanished he had become a master of strategical retreat whistling shrilly he proceeded along the fulham road in the direction of fulham square mansions bindle was in a happy frame of mind it would be strange if a fortnight as porter at fulham square mansions did not produce something in the way of a diversion cheero uncle the remark came from a brazen-faced girl waiting for a bus bindle frowned as he looked her up and down from the low-cut transparent blouse to the short skirt reaching little below her knees if i was your uncle young woman he remarked i'd slap you into becoming decent the girl jumped on to a bus that had just drawn up and with a swirl of skirt and wealth of limb waved her hand as she climbed the stairs so long old dear she cried got enough powder on her face to whitewash her feet remarked a workman to bindle as he resumed his walk women is funny things responded bindle 
they never seems to be wearin so little but what they can't leave orf a bit more you're right there mate replied the man when he had digested the remark if i was the police i'd run em in well said bindle philosophically there is some what likes to see all the goods in the window so long and he turned off the fulham road leaving the workman to pursue his journey puzzling over bindle's enigmatic utterance hello charlie greeted bindle as he entered the porter's lodge of fulham square mansions here i am come to take care of all the little birds in the nest what you're a leaving behind charlie hart was a big man with a heavy moustache a brow whereon the creases of worry had a perpetual abiding place and an indeterminate chin charlie ought to wear a beard was bindle's verdict glad you come joe i'll have to go over things again train don't go till four during the next few hours bindle was once more taken over the salient features of the life of a porter at a block of residential flats charlie hart had no system or order in conveying his instructions and bindle saw that he would have to depend upon his own wits to meet such crises as arose mrs sedge mrs hart's mother would look after those tenants who did not possess servants she's all right when she ain't after royal richard explained charlie hart and who's royal richard inquired bindle with interest gin was charlie hart's laconic response charlie enumerated the numbers of the flats the occupants of which were to be done for one thing he particularly emphasized number six was temporarily vacant the owner was away but it was let furnished from the following monday to miss sissy boy who was one of those to be done for bindle was particularly cautioned to see that there were no carryings on whereat he winked reassuringly mrs sedge was a stolid matron whose outlook on life had reached the dregs of pessimism oh don't ask me was the phrase with which she warded off any attempt at conversation hers was a soul dedicated to royal richard and silence cheery little thing was bindle's summing up of the gloomy mrs sedge bindle had not been in charge an hour before number seven began to get troublesome he was a choleric ex-indian civil servant where's that damn fellow hart he roared thrusting his head into the porter's lodge he's gone to the damned seaside replied bindle imperturbably as he proceeded to light his pipe with elaborate calm taking his damned wife with him he added number seven gasped and who the devil are you he demanded well replied bindle with a grin on the alls i'm little titch but ere i calls myself joe bindle known only as holy joe for a moment number seven his customary redness of face transformed to purple stood regarding bindle fiercely then be damned to you he burst out and turning on his heel dashed upstairs i ain't lived with mrs b nineteen years without learning how to handle explosives remarked bindle as he settled down to read an evening newspaper he had discovered in the letter-box bindle soon discovered that the life of a porter at residential flats is strangely lacking in repose everybody seemed either to want something sent up or came to complain that their instructions had not been carried out the day passed with amazing rapidity at eight o'clock bindle stepped round to the ancient earl for a glass of beer when he returned at nine thirty he found his room in a state of siege oh here he is said someone bindle smiled happily where the devil have you been demanded number seven angrily bindle looked at him steadily having apparently established number seven's identity to his entire satisfaction he spoke now look here sir this is the second time to-day i've ad to speak to you about your language this ain't a peace meetin you speakin like that before ladies too i'm surprised at you oh, i am really now up it and learn some nice words and then come back and beg prettily and p'raps i'll give you a bit of cake you damned insolent fellow thundered number seven i'll report you i'll look here remarked bindle tranquilly if you ain't gone by the time i've finished lightin this pipe he struck a match deliberately i'll oof it myself and then who'll fetch up all the coals in the mornin this master stroke of strategy turned public opinion dead against number seven who retired amidst a murmur of disapproving voices it's ard if i can't go out to see a dyin wife and child without im a comin usin ought words like that grumbled bindle as he proceeded to investigate the cases of the other tenants and their minions 
Number one was expecting a parcel. Had it arrived? No, it had not, but Bindle would not rest until it did. Number twelve, a tall, melancholy-visaged man, had lost fluffles. Where did Bindle think she was? Perhaps she's taken up with another cove, sir, suggested Bindle sympathetically. You never knows where you are with women. The maid from number fifteen giggled. Number twelve explained in a weary tone that Fluffles was a Pekingese spaniel. A dog, you say, sir? cried Bindle. Why didn't you say so before? I might have advertised for, well, well, I'll keep a look out. What's that? he inquired of the maid from number eight. No coal? Can't fetch coal up after six o'clock. That's the rules, he added with decision. But we must have some. We can't go to bed without coal, snapped the girl, an undersized shrewish little creature. Well, Queenie, responded Bindle imperturbably, you'll have to take some firewood to bed with you, if you wants company. Coal you don't get tonight. What about a log? My name's not Queenie, snapped the girl. Ain't it now, remarked Bindle. Shows your father and mother adn't an eye for the right thing, didn't it? I tell you we must have coal, persisted the girl. Now look here, Queenie, my dear. A gal as wants to take coal to bed with her ain't, well, she ain't respectable. Now off you goes like a good gal. I'll get even with you yet, you red-nosed little bounder. I'll pay you. Funny where they learns it all, remarked Bindle to number eleven, a quiet little old lady who wanted a postage stamp. The little lady smiled. She won't be wantin' coal in the next world if she goes on like that, will she, mum? said Bindle as he handed her the stamp. Her mistress has a weak heart, ventured number eleven, and during the raids she shivers so. Now ain't that just like a woman, beggin' your pardon, mum. Why didn't Queenie say that instead of showin' how bad she's been brought up? Right-o, I'll take her up some coal. Ten minutes later Bindle surprised Queenie by appearing at the door of number eight with a pail full of coal. She stared at him in surprise. Bindle grinned. Here you are, Queenie, he said cheerfully. Now you'll be able to go to sleep with a bit in each, and maybe there'll be a bit over to put in your mouth. Look here, don't you go callin' me Queenie. That ain't my name, so there. And the girl banged the door in his face. She'll grow up just like Mrs. B, murmured Bindle as he slowly descended the stairs. And perhaps she can't even cook. I wonder if she's religious. Sort of zoo, this ere little ole. Shouldn't be surprised if things was to happen before old Charlie gets home again. And Bindle returned to his lodge, where, removing his boots and throwing off his coat, he lay down on the couch that served as a bed for the porter at Fulham Square Mansions. During the next two days Bindle discovered that his duties were endless. Everybody seemed to want something, or have some complaint to make. He was expected to be always at his post, night and day, and if he were not he was threatened with a possible complaint to the secretary of the company to which the flats belonged. Bindle's fertile brain, however, was not long in devising a means of relieving the monotony without compromising poor old Charlie. He sent home for his special constable's uniform, although he had obtained a fortnight's leave on account of his work. Henceforth, whenever he required relaxation, he donned his official garb, which he found a sure defense against all complaints. "'Well, Queenie,' he remarked one evening to the maid at number eight, "'I'm off to catch the robbers what might carry you away.' i can see you catchin a man snorted the girl scornfully sorry i can't return the compliment little lovebird retorted bindle so long queenie had found her match two you er have a furnished er flat to let bindle looked up from the paper he was reading a timid mouse-like little man with side whiskers and a deprecating manner stood on the threshold "'Come in, sir,' said Bindle heartily. "'But I'm afraid it's let.' "'But the board's up,' replied the applicant. Bindle rose, walked to the outer door, and there saw the notice-board announcing that a furnished flat was to let. "'Funny me not noticing that,' he murmured to himself as he returned to the porter's lodge. "'Was you wantin' it for long, sir?' he inquired. "'A month, I think,' was the reply. "'But three weeks.' Oh, i'm sorry sir began bindle then he smacked his leg with such suddenness that the stranger started back in alarm his soft felt hat falling from his head and hanging behind him attached to a hat guard now isn't that jest like me cried bindle his face wreathed in smiles 
the stranger eyed bindle nervously as he fumbled to retrieve the lost headgear looking like a dog endeavouring to ascertain if he still possessed the tail i was thinking of the other one said bindle yes there's number six to let from next monday what is the rent inquired the caller bindle who had no idea of the rent of furnished flats decided to temporize i'll go and ask sir he said what was you exactly wantin and about what figure well a bedroom bathroom sitting-room kitchen and attendance would do was the reply i do not want to pay more than three and a half guineas a week now ain't that funny cried bindle and without waiting to explain what was funny he picked up the key of number six from his desk now you just come with me sir and i'll show you the very place you're wantin number six consisted of two bedrooms a sitting-room bathroom and kitchen charlie hart had taken bindle over it explaining that miss sissy boy who was entering into occupation on the following monday would use only the smaller bedroom with the single bed therefore the double bedded room was to remain locked the applicant who introduced himself as mr jabez stiffson expressed himself as quite satisfied with all he saw and agreed to enter into possession on the following monday afternoon at a rental of three and a half guineas a week he appeared mildly surprised at bindle waiving the question of references and a deposit but agreed that the smaller bedroom should be kept locked as containing the owner's personal possessions mrs stiffson he explained was staying with friends in the country their own house being let but she would join him on the tuesday morning in the privacy of his own apartment bindle rubbed his hands with glee if this ain't going to be a little story for the night club he murmured well put me down as a cuthbert he persuaded mrs sedge to get both rooms ready in case of accidents as he expressed it bindle foresaw that there might be some difficulty in the matter of catering for mr jabez stiffson but he left that to the inspiration of the moment he looked forward to monday as a schoolboy looks forward to the summer holidays he forgot to rebuke queenie when she became impertinent he allowed number seven to swear with impunity and he even forgot to don his specials uniform and go on duty in short he forgot everything save the all-absorbing topic of miss sissy boy and mr jabez stiffson on monday mrs sedge was persuaded to take a half day off she announced her intention of putting some flowers on her husband's grave in kilburn cemetery well remarked bindle who knew that mrs sedge's kilburn cemetery was the public bar of the ancient earl you won't want no bus fares you go hein with a nose like that retorted mrs sedge in no way displeased well don't be late in the morning grinned bindle at six thirty mr jabez stiffson arrived with a bewildering collection of impedimenta ranging from a canary in a cage to a thermos flask bindle put all that he could in the double bedded room the rest he managed to store in the kitchen a slight difficulty arose over the canary mr stiffson suggested the dining room wouldn't he sort of feel lonely without seeing you when he opened his little eyes questioned bindle solicitously a cove i knew once had a canary which had a fit through being lonely and they had to throw water over him to bring him to and then what do you think sir mr stiffson shook his head in mournful foreboding he come to a sparrow he did really sir that settled the canary who slept with mr stiffson it was nearly eight before mr stiffson was settled and he announced his intention of going out to dine at ten he was ready for bed having implored bindle to see that he was up by eight as mrs stiffson would inevitably arrive at ten i'm a very heavy sleeper he announced to bindle's great relief and my watch has stopped he added some dirt must have got into the works if mrs stiffson were to arrive before i was up he did not venture to state what would be the probable consequence but his manner implied that mrs stiffson was a being of whom he stood in great awe just as bindle was leaving for the night mr stiffson called him back porter i'm worried about oscar bindle noticed that mr stiffson's hands were moving nervously are you really sir inquired bindle wondering who oscar might be the bird you know continued mr stiffson answering bindle's unuttered question you you don't think it will be unhygienic for him to sleep with me 
sure of it sir replied bindle entirely at a loss as to mr stiffson's meaning mr stiffson sighed his relief and bade bindle good night with a final exhortation as to waking him at eight you know he added i always sleep through air raids mr stiffson's bugbear in life was lest he should oversleep he seldom failed to wake of his own account but constitutionally lacking in self-reliance he felt that at any moment he might commit the unpardonable sin of oversleeping bindle returned to his room to await the arrival of miss sissy boy it was nearly midnight when his alert ear caught the sound of a taxi drawing up outside as he opened the outer door, Miss Sissy Boy appeared at the top of the stone steps. Bindle caught a glimpse of a dainty little creature in a long travelling coat with fur at the collar, cuffs, and round the bottom, a small travelling hat, and a thick veil. "'Oh, can you help with my luggage?' she cried. right -o, miss. You go in there and sit by the fire. We'll have things right in a jiffy.' and bindle proceeded to tackle miss boy's luggage which consisted of a large dress basket a suitcase and a bundle of rugs and umbrellas when these had been placed in the hall and the taxi-man paid bindle went into his lodge miss boy was sitting before the fire her coat thrown open and her veil thrown back between her dainty fingers she held a cigarette so that's that she cried i'm so tired mr porter bindle regarded her with admiration honey-coloured fluffy hair blue eyes dark eyebrows and lashes pretty petite features in a manner that suggested half baby half woman of the world bindle found her wholly alluring i'm afraid we can't get that little picnic camper of yours upstairs to-night miss he remarked miss boy laughed isn't it huge she cried it needn't go up till the morning i've all i want in the suitcase you must have a rare lot of duds miss remarked bindle duds interrogated miss boy clothes miss explained bindle miss boy laughed lightly miss boy laughed at everything now i must go to bed i've got a call to-morrow at eleven as they went upstairs bindle learnt quite a lot about miss boy among other things that she was appearing in the review at the regent theatre known as kiss me quick that she never ate suppers that she took a warm bath every morning and liked coffee bacon and eggs and strawberry jam for breakfast you'll be very quiet miss in the flat won't you he whispered sure replied miss boy they're such a funny lot here he explained if a fly wakes up too early or a bird has a nightmare they comes down and complains next morning miss boy laughed hush miss please whispered bindle as he switched on the electric light in the hall of number six bindle showed the new tenant the sitting-room bathroom kitchen and finally her own bedroom you will be quiet miss won't you bindle interrogated anxiously or you may wake oscar who's oscar queried miss boy you'll see him in the morning miss replied bindle with a grin good night miss good night mr porter smiled miss boy and she closed the door now i wonder if anything will happen before old whiskers gets up in the morning mused bindle as he descended the stairs to his room end of chapter nine read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com